Thank you for joining us for Marine Science Day. My name is Savannah Mapes, and I will be your host for this session. In this session, Dr. Mark Lukenbach, the Associate Dean of Research and Advisory Service at PHIMS, and Daryl Shire, an Environmental Manager at Dominion Energy, will be talking to us about the science of offshore wind. After a short presentation, we will have a Q&A session in which Mark and Daryl will answer your questions on the topic. Now, I will turn it over to Daryl to get us started. Yeah, so uh, again, thank you for letting me uh, present to you. Uh, I'm Daryl Shire with Dominion Energy, and I'd like to talk to you about an offshore wind project that we are currently have installed and a second one we're planning to install off of the coast of Virginia Beach in the state of Virginia. Uh, so first of all, let me talk about you know why we want to put in offshore wind. Uh, first of all, you know we uh, want to generate power as cleanly as we can. Uh, we have a, a company goal to go to carbon zero by 2050. We also think that this particular project and, and U.S. projects in general are good for the economy. They're good for job growth. They're good for manufacturing. A lot of the components of the uh, turbines hopefully will be built in U.S. territory. And in fact, we're building a vessel just to put these uh, turbines in the water, and that's being built in the United States. So where exactly is our project? This is the uh, map that you can see the little inset. It's off the coast of Virginia Beach in the Atlantic Ocean, about 27 miles off the coast. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've got two projects. Uh, in 2020, we installed two uh, eight megawatt turbines in the waters off of, uh, you can see the little uh, yellow rectangle, uh, and the uh, energy gets exported along that yellow line to the shore. Uh, in, starting in 2024, we hope to install 188 14 megawatt turbines that'll be capable of generating 2600 megawatts of energy. Uh, that installation will take place between 2024 and 2026. Let me talk a little bit about the, the pilot turbines. Uh, I said eight megawatts, they are six megawatts, 12 megawatts total. That's about enough to power 3000 homes. Um, they're about 600 feet tall, which is about the height of the Washington Monument. Uh, they're inside a, a lease, again, 27 miles off the coast of Virginia Beach. And, uh, and we're very proud of this, it's the first uh, wind turbines permitted in federal waters of the United States. Uh, and the reason we did it too was uh, it gives us, uh, uh, as a pilot, is to give a, us a lot of experience both with the permitting and the installation of these turbines in these waters. Because it's a pilot project, we are able to and have conducted a lot of research and continuing to do uh, research and studies along the way. So for example, these are some photos from foundation surveys that we've been conducting on the seabed and around the, the, the turbines to look at sediment transport, to look at aquatic life. And you, you can see there's, uh, uh, it's, it's changing the, the, the habitats and we wanna know what that change is, uh, what those changes are. Uh, we also get an opportunity, had an opportunity to study how the installation affects the, the, the acoustic environment. Uh, acoustics are very important to marine mammals and turtles. Uh, that that sound can be damaging, or uh, certainly, or can change behaviors. And so we did took an opportunity to. Um, well, first of all, when we installed these turbines, we use protected species observers to monitor the the space around the installation uh, at, at during different parts of the project. Pile driving is the most um, noisy part of the project. And so our uh, zones of exclusion and monitoring are very wide at those points. And, and that was based on the existing science uh, to establish how far out those zones needed to be. And they can be different for different species. Uh, but one of the interesting things we did during the installation, so again, I mentioned there were two turbines that went in. Uh, with one of those turbines, we uh, used a sound mitigation measure called the uh, double bubble curtain. And you can see in this uh, photo on the lower left, you can see two concentric rings of bubbles. And that provided a sound barrier that uh, reduced the sound significantly 
and that obviously protects species and 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 uh, uh, that are sensitive to to acoustics in in the ocean. Uh, this happens to be some photos of a right whale that was spotted out by one of our protected species observers back in December, uh, off the uh, you know around in, in the environment of the project. And, and during this period, there was no installation going on. This was just a a research or study vessel looking at the commercial project. Um, but we we do also uh, take advantage. Uh, we also make use of you know speed uh, speed restrictions on vessels. We uh, can use passive acoustic monitoring at times if needed, uh, night, night vision uh, equipment. And uh, we also, and more, most importantly, work outside of uh, the, a period called the North Atlantic right whale migration period when those whales uh, can be present in Virginia waters. So between November 1 and April 30, we don't do uh, uh, pile driving. We don't do that very intense sound uh, creation. Um, skipping to the commercial project, uh, again, this is going to be 188 turbines, uh, 14 megawatts, so more than doubling the, the, the energy output, um, and that will create about six, uh, 2,600 megawatts of energy. Uh, that's enough to power about 600,000 homes. These two, these uh, 188 turbines will be about 200 feet taller at, at 800 feet. Um, that gives you more uh, swept area, which is why they can generate that much more electricity. And I showed you where they were. It's uh, 27 miles off the coast of Virginia. When it's installed, that will be the largest offshore wind project in, in the U.S. waters. Um, this kind of diagrams how we get that energy. I mean, we obviously have offshore the turbines. There'll be offshore substations that will collect that energy. We transmit that energy through buried um, cables buried below the seabed uh, to switching stations and substations onshore. And then we, we eventually will route it to an existing um, Dominion Energy substation in the town of Chesapeake, Virginia. And there it gets uh, distributed into our, our existing uh, energy grid. This project is uh, subject to a lot of permitting elements. Uh, in particular, the National Environmental Policy Act guides this process. And so the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the lead agency. Uh, we have submitted what's called a construction operating plan uh, to BOEM. Um, on June 18, they will kick off the what's called the environmental impact study for this um, in the commercial installation. Uh, they expect to have, that's about a two-year process, and so late 2023, early 2024, we would expect to be uh, beginning the installation of these, of these turbines. And I mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of study both with the pilot test, but also in preparation for the commercial installation. A, a lot of elements have to go in and a lot of study has to, to be done. Uh, there's, I won't go through this long list, um, uh, but I will note the, the, the diagram on the right. It's one of the uh, uh, visual monitoring transects that was done looking at the population of, of birds in the project area. This is in the pilot project area, but similar studies will take place for the commercial project. And, and this list is, is important because this is also where we hope to uh, be able to work together with them. So this is where our project and science, we need good science to, to inform our project so that we uh, do things right. And so to talk about that, I'm going to um, transfer the mic over to uh, Mark and let him talk to you about how VIMS can, uh, is working with us on this project. Um, what, I'm into, what I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about is what role VIMS can play in the development of environmentally responsible offshore wind energy, uh, specifically in, in the coastal, Vir coastal Virginia offshore wind project, but also along the Atlantic coast in general. So the first thing we, that we bring to the table is a really wide breadth of, of relevant experience. Uh, this is only a partial list. We have 
researchers that, and I don't need to read through all of these, but the things it's diverse as fishery science, uh, coastal uh, geology, uh, really, really um, uh, uh, state-of-the-art sophisticated hydrodynamic modeling. We even have fisheries and resource economists. Um, so we bring a wide range of expertise to, to the topic. But we also bring something else as it, VIMS has this, this really fairly unique advisory mission that's mandated by the state. Um, most, most universities will say have missions of research, education and service and that generally means service to the community. Uh, and, and certainly we have, we have uh, individuals that do that, but we're actually mandated in the code of Virginia to be the science advisor to the Commonwealth on matters related to coastal and marine science. And we play a very formal role in providing science-based advice to state permitting agencies related to coastal and marine resources. In fact, all of our faculty members and my researchers have, a, have an expectation to contribute to this advisory service. And, and so translating science into policy, I mean, like to say is really in our DNA. It's part of our job. Um, we also have, uh, I'm only mention a few of the extensive data sets that we have that, that, that are helpful. We have long running coastal fishery surveys. We have a, uh, a survey that, that uh, trawls uh, from Cape Hatteras to Cape Cod twice a year covering hundreds of stations, um, bottom trawl for fishes. Um, we have long running uh, Atlantic sea scallop surveys that range from Virginia to New England. And we've had numerous surveys and, and research studies associated with the surf clam and ocean cohogs, which are two clam fisheries that take place uh, in, yeah, along the coast. We also recently um, had a custom built vessel uh, for, which is just the RV Virginia, which is just perfect for doing the kind of work that needs to be done in and around uh, wind farms where, where conventional vessels uh, that would work in these areas uh, are simply too large to, to, to have the, the, to get in there and work. Uh, not only is this, is this vessel uh, really adequate for working in those areas, um, but it's also, we're installing state-of-the-art state multi-beam sonar suite that allows us to do high resolution mapping on the bottom and data collection that can include the contours of the seafloor, the sediment type. Well, it, it enables us to count and identify sometimes the species, sometimes higher, the marine life that we see in there. And, and, I, and it's some, something that I think is gonna be a really useful tool. There's nothing, it doesn't have anything else that's, uh, there's nothing else uh, in the US right now that has these capabilities in a, a vessel that's only 93 feet long or usually usually in the 200 foot range. So we're, our advisory mandate uh, involves, that involves VIMS in the, in, the, in the evaluation of activities that require state permits. I mean, that's the mandate we have. The Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project as, as Daryl told you, is in federal waters. And so the, the farm itself doesn't require any Virginia permits. Uh, a, a few are needed when, a, when a, and the, the transmission cable uh, goes into state waters or, and then up in onto land through, through the intertidal marshes. Um, so we'll be involved there in, in permits. And that would have been our all, really only formal involvement. But uh, quite a few months ago now, Dominion proactively reached out to VIMS and asked for science-based uh, analysis, advice, analysis, and even studies. So working together, we developed a memorandum of understanding that established an independent science advisory committee and laid out the framework for VIMS to, to do research and analysis uh, in the coastal uh, Virginia offshore wind lease. I'll repeat again, this isn't, this isn't something that, um, that that they were demanded to do, as Daryl indicates, their um, their major permitting requirements are going to be through the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So 
we think it's a great opportunity. It's a great, it's a great collaboration. It's a good way up front to bring concerns about the environment and concerns and fixes about any of the environmental issues. And, and instead of coming in after the fact and, and, and trying to study it. So with that, I'm, I'll, um, I'll turn the uh, mic back over to Savannah. Thanks so much, Mark and Daryl. This is a really fascinating project. It is time for the Q&A session. So I'll kick us off with a question for Daryl. Daryl, you mentioned how Dominion is working to protect the marine animals offshore, but could you tell us more about how Dominion plans to protect the sensitive environments at the coastal or shorelines? Yeah, sure. So the, the, the zone just right at the waterline, that is just behind the waterline and just offshore of the, the waterline, that's a particularly, it's an environmentally rich area. And so to, to, we want to avoid those impacts. So from, we will do what's called a horizontal directional bore from behind the dunes, under the dunes, under the near shore, and then we will come out several hundred yards in the ocean and then begin uh, more conventional trenching. So that, by doing that, we're underneath all those sensitive environments and not impacting them. Thanks, Daryl. And another question. Um, will Dominion consider installing acoustic receivers on the base of the turbines to improve acoustic telemetry projects along the East Coast? So I'm assuming you're, we're talking about uh, marine mammal detection. And so we are working, uh, and this is a project that we will either be working with VIMS or perhaps the Virginia Aquarium to look at what kind of uh, gaps or what kind of studies need to happen uh, to detect and protect marine mammals. So those are discussions that are underway. I don't know exactly where they will end up. I don't know exactly what that monitoring will look like at this point, but that's also something that, that's being, um, being discussed. Can I add something to that, Savannah? I think there will be the opportunity to add, to do not only the, the acoustics ones that are sort of active, active detectors for, for marine mammals, but it'll, there are passive acoustic receivers that pick up signals from tags. And so those are the types of things that, and we've got some of those arrays of those inside the bay. Those are the kind of things that we'll, be end, up, we'll end up recommending to Dominion and looking for places to do it. So we can find when, let's say tag sturgeon or tag billfish are in the air. Those are just passive. Thank you. And we're also doing that, Mark, that's a great point. We're also talking about putting that same sort of detection for birds and bats that have been, there, there are micro tags on many, especially migratory birds that and may travel through this project area. And so we're right now looking at the feasibility of installing uh, Yagi antennas on the pilot turbines to uh, see if we can uh, help that detection, help that particular monitoring of those tagged birds. Someone noted that studies have shown that adding a black blade makes it easier for birds to steer around turbines. Could that be done in this project to protect our migrating birds? That's not something I'm aware of, but I'll take that note and, and we'll take a look at that. Yeah, as you noted, the, as you can see from our pictures, the turbine blades are white, um, but that's uh, not something I'm familiar with, but again, I'll, I'll go back and take a look at that. Is Dominion doing anything to protect the pelvic avian species? Yeah, the avian species that may be impacted by these turbines? So right now we're looking at, so, so there's several things uh, that we're doing. We're uh, talking with uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service about what the uh, pre-construction monitoring will happen to look at you know, the bird populations moving through the project area. That, and then that would lead into post-construction monitoring to see you know, are, we, are we changing the, the, the habitat for those birds. Um, we're also looking at one of the, one of the uh, big attractants for birds and bats are, is lighting uh, because that attracts uh, insects, food sources. Uh, one of the newer, uh, uh, 
technologies is, is, a, is an automated light so that you know, we've got certain aviation requirements so that you know a, a, an airplane can know where these turbines are. There's now uh, in, uh, technology that can turn the lights on when an airplane is in the vicinity rather than having those lights on 24 seven or during the entire night. Uh, so we think that's a technology that uh, certainly can can help the, the, the bird habitat. Okay, great. Thank you, Daryl. And you said that the towers were as high as the Washington Mo Monument. Is that high above water? How much is below the water? So these, yeah, that's above water. So these towers sit in about 80 feet of water that the pilot turbines, and then, you know, there's a certain amount below the seabed as well. So these are very large turbines, and that's just the pilot turbine. The, the, uh, the commercial turbine will be another 200 feet higher. Um, and so it's, it, it's, it's, it's quite a large installation. Okay, I'm waiting for another question to come in, but we only have two more minutes. So are there any final statements either of you would like to share? Well, I wanted to, I thought, I thought um, uh, two, two things that Dominion has, has done in this project at this point, which um, are exactly what we recommend when we're doing things, we, when we're, as I say, we make recommendations for what has to happen in state waters in the Chesapeake Bay. I, I guess actually three things. VIMS always advises on uh, our state agencies on time of year restrictions, when to not make noise right, and not, not to drive piles. We advise in the use of, of, of bubble curtains and preferably double bubble curtains. And when, we come to, and when you come to sensitive environments like going up through the intertidal and, and the marshes and, and even the shallow subtitle, the directional boring is, is the method we always advise on. So when uh, those, those fit the types of things that, that, that we would always uh, recommend that our state agencies require in, in, in granting permits for this type of activity. And, and let me just say that it's, it's been a pleasure working with them. We've, we've had a, a lot of discussions with some really excited scientists who are just so eager to dig into this and, and look at what we're doing and work with us on how to do it in, in the best possible fashion. So that excitement is, is, is infectious and, and we, we are going to hopefully have a, a long and, and valuable um, work product coming out of this collaboration. Well, thank you so much, Marv and Daryl, for being here and helping us learn more about the innovation of offshore wind. Thank you so much for all who are joining us today.